So I wanted to start with a little introduction to both of you and to CMS for our audience uh, to know who you are in case they don't. In 1971, our guests today, Ingrid Serzo and Carl Berger, founded with Ornette Coleman the Creative Music Studio as a crucible, let's say, for the exploration and expansion of music as a universal language focusing on improvisation and musical cross-pollination. In the 50 years since then, 50 years, right? Countless right. musicians, as well as philosophers and artists in all disciplines, I think, have participated in CMS's residencies, workshops, intensives, improvisation jam sessions, concerts, and CMS and its founders have been recognized for their impact, not only in the indiv individual musicians who participated in its offerings, but also on those musicians' wide-ranging communities. And today, CMS remains an active force for these explorations with an expanded roster of artists on board and offerings in multiple locations. So, Carl and Ingrid, um, through the years, you've developed a set of foundational principles or tools for music as a practice, like flow as a natural state of mind, silence as a potent musical space, rhythm and breath as the basis of and for everything, um, the power and necessity of intuition and feeling. And when I see those guidelines and principles that you're working from, what I, what comes up for me is that what you're doing is breaking down the artificial barrier that exists in Western cultures anyway between making music and just being a human being. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to invite you uh, to talk a little bit about that for the benefit of both musicians and people who don't think of themselves as artists. Can you just talk a little bit more about those guiding principles? Well, you know, it's, it started quite simply with the question um, that I had together with Ornette and Ingrid is um, what is sort of common to all the music in the world? And to start with that rather than, because I, I saw in school with whatever education there was, people would always fall into categories and styles and study within that style. The reason for that was um, um, I want, we wanted to like support the idea of individuality in music regardless of style. Hmm. So that somebody who would like study music would um, not just um, emulate what other people have done, but, but try to find their own voice which is unique to begin with. When you get born, you have your own voice. As a matter of fact, voice prints are more accurate than fingerprints, you know? <laughs> so therefore, everybody is sort of, you could say everybody is born a genius, like, because they're unique. You know, you're unique. You have like, and you have an abundance of talent because um, all of life is based on rhythm and sound and the silence and, uh, and these elements and dynamics, you know? And uh, so you could approach music from a much broader scale than let's say a music school does, which already has a system, you know, like a C is a C and an A is an A, and now you have to learn your ABC. <laughs> and that ABC is different from, let's say, a, a class in Turkey or in Afghanistan or somewhere in India. And, but uh, we just had the feeling in the 60s that we can all play together, <laughs> no matter what our background is, you know? Right. Well, how is that possible? So we wanted to find a way to sort of uh, facilitate this uh, breaking through the barriers of style. You know, like when, with the stuff that you learned you know, a classical player doesn't know how to play with a jazz player, and a jazz player doesn't know how to play with a Turkish guy, and so on, right? right. And there are very simple principles that we need to sort of, like, sort of give backwards in, 
to what I call the found fundamental uh, or ground floor of study, which is sort of missing in schools. And they're missing for a good reason, because it's not like something that you can pinpoint as well as, um, let's say, categories and styles, you know. So how right. do you grade somebody's uh, uh. Uh, creativity, you know, if it's not like based on certain categories and so on? Right. So that was, it. that's like Ornette's, uh, Ornette's whole philosophy has been like around his music was about all of that. You know, even his last album he called Sound Grammar, which means the grammar of the sound in the world, you know, not just of a certain place. Sure. Yeah. And, and this was um, at the same time, at the same time, the other barrier that you mentioned is the barrier between the professional and the uh, mature and the listener. And there seems to be such a big uh, space between like where people get like sort of worried and, and get afraid of how difficult music is and how much you have, and, and a lot of a lot of teachers actually uh, emphasize how, how how much you have to work and what you have to learn and it's like endless and people get discouraged you know yeah. and uh, at CMS we tried to accommodate musicians on almost any level um, because the emphasis is not so much on technique, the emphasis is more on expression, on uh, like how what, how you express your feelings through sound and rhythm and music, you know, and there's a lot of musicians who are very successful in the world who are not really technically that youth, that hugely adapt um, and, uh, and trained but they know how to express their feelings through sound. Right. And, you know, some right. of the most successful music that I, musicians that I worked with as an arranger, like singers and so on, they could not even write music or read music or, or having like this training necessarily. So we try to, we try to go from a much more fundamental basis of um, understanding rhythm and sound and silence and create your own music from there. And that that can definitely always end, uh, end, uh, end in, a, in a stylistic context. It's, it's not that you should ignore style. It's basically you should just be free of it so that you can choose to play within a style or not or whatever. You, know? you become free. You play your music. And. Do you see that these uh, same principles have an application in people's lives beyond playing music? Well, there's no doubt about that because uh, essentially we are musical beings. Like when we walk down the street, we do it, we are in rhythm, right? Right. Right. We, are, we have a heartbeat. We have a brain waves. Everything rhythmical. If the rhythm stops, we're dead. Right? <laughs> right. Essentially, <laughs> we are rhythmical beings. You know, you can essentially studying music from that perspective would have every anyone, uh, listeners or players. It doesn't have to. You don't have to be a player to really get uh, some uh, something out of. Uh, studying music from the point of view of listening more deeply, you know? Mm. You yes. You might have heard of Pauline Oliveros. Of course. She has, um, she has a program called Deep Listening. Right. And Ingrid worked a lot with Pauline, and Pauline has been also part, at one point in the 90s, um, a director of the Creative Music Studio. Mm. Yes, he, he was part a big part of it at a, at a certain point. And listening is probably the most important issue that we are at the right. Essentially, essentially, if we want to go beyond a certain habit, or uh, style is actually a habit, right? we want to go through beyond any habits in either playing or listening, you have to listen more. Not, not do more, but listen more. Mm -hmm. 
Ingrid, do you, do you want to add some? Well, I'm coming from a, a highly artistic family in Europe. And uh, there was always this leading sentence of Picasso that you probably know. Um, Music and art is in every child. Mm. The problem is how to stay in it when mm. you grow up. And so um, the singing standards in Europe, before I even met Carl, had my own agent and it wasn't enough for me. So Don, when Don came along, you know, Don Cherry, Don Cherry I, I already opened up. And then Don brought us over and we met Onet Coleman, and that did it, you know, because Onet's openness and deep belief in the creativity that is in everybody kept us stay here because we didn't want to, because it was not a situation that was ideal for a European coming over in the 70s. There was mm. a lot of depressing stuff. But Onet's openness and you know, I didn't, I admired him. We heard him first on record in Europe. And the first thing when I went to the village gate uh, in the intermission to listen to Onet, in the intermission, he said to me, you got to sit in with me after the intermission. And I was thinking, me? With Onet Coleman? I can't do that. You know, that that's impossible. But he said he heard had heard of me. And uh, he had just had such a belief that this creativity and musicality is in everybody, you know, since he knew already that I was singing. But that's another thing, you know, I passed out on every invitation Onet gave me, and I'm really upset about it, but I loved him so much. I did that with no musician that, you know, I felt like a little girl, you know, uh, when he asked me and then we came up to Woodstock. I had my daughter and we didn't want to be in the city. And Carl had this fantastic idea of, of creating creative music studio, you know. I have North African forefathers. I have through my brother, that's a fantastic painter, a big love. He introduced me to a lot of records, then already from Africa. And, um, so in Africa, my first impression that I never, I never forget was that the audience and the musicians, performers, were equal. It wasn't like the audience sitting down there in an evening dress and we are up on stage and there is this barrier in between, you know. Right. It's so, and then through Don, who was so much into world music, he got inspired by everything, whether it was a ship horn from a big boat, or it was something from Turkey, or he had this, what is it called? Yes, he, no, that radio where you oh, get shortwave, shortwave oh. radio. He always had it with him, you know. And so his music was already, already like that at the Shaki Pesh in Europe. And... Um, and that was when then when Carl came and said, "Well, we we gonna do, we were both interested in meeting musicians from all over the world, uh. and we both had from beginning and meeting Onet, who was our most powerful influence, Don and Onet, the deep belief in the ability of every person in this world to do music, to be in art, to be creative, and that's the basic." philosophy of CMA. Mm, that's beautiful. Let's take a little commercial break um, and and talk about the uh, monthly event in Kingston. Yes, um, at the end, uh, last Sunday of each month, there is a, a loft that uh, Bill Hobart um, has in Kingston. Uh, Bill Hobart, the filmmaker, mm. did um, or uh, what was the film called again? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Dan just said Queen's Gambit. Queen's Gambit. Ah, oh, Queen's Gambit. The yeah. like Cold Mountain was... Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 So, but Bill is also... Nobody knows that. He's also... 
Uh, we're just we're losing you. Say, Bill is also what? A flute player. A flute player. Uh, yeah. So he, he plays in the orchestra. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so when he's and we did like in the last ten years, we did more than a hundred concerts in New York with the improvisers orchestra. Great mm. your improvisers orchestra. Beautiful. I'm conducting, and it's a certain conducting style I developed. Uh, and also the philosophy of tuning and harmonizing without mu without written music. Without written music, right. Or larger group. Yeah. Like yeah. a total unique kind of thing that developed as CMS over many he years. He started it at CMS. <laughs> now there's many such, there's many such groups now that do it Yes. But, um, uh, I can hardly say that we started it all at CMS in the 70s. And the, the principle is really about listening so closely that you can harmonize without having to think about what knows you like. Right. So you're just playing from listening, you know, and the notes that, that, you, that you produce on your instruments will come from that rather than from thinking about it. Right. And so this is like a practice that we all can do, whether we are players or listening. A switch from thinking to listening at any time of the day or night. Listening. Whatever it listening. is. Listening. Whatever that's going on at the moment. I learned about that the most when I start doing improvised music. Yeah. Because yes. we're playing together. Yeah. I'm not right. just in front and somebody backs me up together and you have to come in yeah. and it's fantastic. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. I agree. The improvised orchestra was start in, in the, was playing in the last, let's say from 2013, I think, till 2020. We played in New York. And the first year we played every Monday at Stone. the Stone. Uh -huh. sure. I remember. It's all spreads. And, um, and I, one day a, a, a writer from the Wall Street Journal came in. And he wrote about the lush harmonies that he heard. There was not one note written. They, people created the lush harmonies that right. the writer could hear. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really amazing what happens in an orchestral concert if you start to really listen. I would like to hear a little bit about Music Mind, about the book and the movie. And then if we have time, I'll get to my other question. Okay. Right. Well, the, the book is called The Music Mind Experience, and it's, it's precisely about all of what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, it really is about understanding the sort of what I call the ground floor of music, that is like the ground floor of every kind of music in the world. Based on them, very simply, it is rhythm, it is sound, it is dynamics, and it's space. Mm -hmm. You know, those four things you we can start like you start uh, working with in, in any style and start to get like ideas about uh, how you deal with rhythm, how you deal with sound, how you deal with dynamics, how you deal with space, you know. And then it's all about listening and about personality. You know, I'm trying to really emphasize that everybody is unique and therefore will produce different kinds of music. And we usually don't believe in our own music because it just doesn't sound like anybody else's music, you know? Yeah. How could it, right? right. So, so most, most people stop trying because they can't sound like anybody else. But that's actually, that's the plus that you have, you know? All you need to do is cultivate what you have. Right. Because nobody has what you have, you know? Uh, I mean, I could talk about this with you for hours. This comes up all the time with my students. Well, it took this it took very me, thing that you're talking it about. Is, it's like you have to report, report, repeat it a hundred times. Yeah. Well, because it's a lifelong, it really is a lifelong yeah. endeavor. That's the thing. And that, to me, that's one of the great gifts of music is that we can go through our whole lives still developing, still exploring, still letting things unfold and uncovering more. And, and not just music, but really any 
any artistic discipline or any any discipline that really engages us. Yeah. Well, music, you know, music is not just a metaphor for everything else in life. It's, it's even the essence of what's going on in life. Mm. This is something very few people really know how to connect to. Because the music really points at vibration. And, and uh, the physicists know very well that there's nothing else but vibration. There is no fixed man. But right. you cannot really get into that uh, from a ripple point of view. But we can get into it through music. You know, and right. this is what attracts it, it, it's like an unconscious process why people are attracted to music. It's because there's the actual reality that the physicists are talking about. You can actually, you actually experience yourself in the world of vibration. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I sh it's not for me to agree. I think it's just true. I think it's what it is, but th something that we don't think about enough, perhaps. Yeah. Well, yeah. the whole point is, if you have, you have to stop thinking in order to experience it. Ingrid, you um, talked about how when you started improvising, how things opened up for you. Yeah, because uh, it can get very automatic if you keep, if you have to sing Lover Man in all these clubs I worked in again and again. <laughs> you know, you get. Right. You learn, you know it, you know it, you right. learn it. Yeah. And I loved it. I loved the standards, but I wanted to get already out of standard singing because I couldn't relate to a lot of the lyrics. Mm. The melody was fantastic, but for me, it's highly important that I can relate to what I'm singing. Mm -hmm. And so sure. I started to do my own poetry. I don't call it poetry. It's just words for the songs or lyrics or, you know, I, I'm in poetry books and I, I'm at the Poetry Circle in Woodstock. And But um, when I worked with Don uh, in, in uh, Paris a few times, uh, there was this openness where I was out of a sudden, I have to come in with something that I'm not used to by just listening to who's playing with me, you know? Right. And so um, it's, I, I just love it. It's fantastic. But then I always feel like I do at least one or two standards uh -huh. just out of, so the people, because it can, I don't want to go into a total egotistic trip where I have to make people listen to what I'm doing. <laughs> They should also, because there's fantastic standards out there, yeah. and they're beautiful, and people know them. And right. so, you know, I built up this little system, one or two standards when I sing. Music, it seems to be very important uh, to, to, to listen to the listener. Listen to the listener? Listen to the listener. You know, the reaction that you have, like the feeling in the room, mm -hmm. the, the, the feeling, a connection to the listener. where well, you can feel it when there is a connection. Happening. Definitely. And that happens much easier if you don't play music that like people cannot really relate to in any way, shape or form. Huh. And it happens a lot. Like a lot of artists are producing music that does not really put a bridge out. Hmm. Like at the handout for somebody, like there's no way. In playing improvised music, there's hardly any repetition. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Now, composers, when you, when you look at old composers <coughs> like Bach or Mozart, <coughs> Beethoven, piano music or whatever, just look like there's repeat signs all over. Right. Right. You, you play, right. You, and then you play this, this this part again. Because now the listener has heard it and right. will listen very differently to the next time they heard the same thing. Right? Yeah. So one of our goals, one, one of my goals is to keep the material as as uh, clear as possible 
and stay in a certain mode for long enough for people to really get comfortable mm. rather than just throwing ideas after another. Yes, yeah. I mean, I've had that experience myself. And if you can hang on something, you know, as a musician, yeah. if you can hang on something and allow, create a space for something else to develop out of that, it can be such a beautiful thing. When people go to a concert, they usually, they actually want to play. They, they come because they, they, they want to play themselves, actually. Mm -hmm. It's unconscious, it's not conscious. Right. It's like an unconscious thing. You go to a concert because you want to be connected with the music somehow. You know? Yeah. As a listener, you are a player. Right. In a lot of ways. So yeah. What, 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 what I'm more emphasizing, what we are emphasizing more and more is now the sense of space because as soon as you stop playing the listener can play in their own heads they can respond you know right. like when you, when you take a, a little break in a phrase and you just wait mm. just that long you can feel the vibes coming back from the audience That's people are beautiful. just getting into the music themselves they have room to do so right but a lot of a lot of musicians, I think now, are like over overloading the audience mm. with, with information, you know, which is just too much to take. Mm. At point, you know? Interesting. Just taking that much. So the yeah. point is to be comfort, to create a sense of comfort, the sense of uh, lifting up, the sense of feeling togetherness. A mm. sense of feeling free, a sense of feeling comfortable, you know, at the same time creating something new and exciting, something that you haven't heard before, something something that uh, gives you ideas of the, your own. So this mix is like is that's the art of that's the art of improvisation for my for my, my mm. I've worked with a lot of different musicians and I was always bothered by some that said, oh, don't worry about the audience, they don't understand. Huh. Because for me, in Europe, when I started, the audience was always sensitive. They always reacted, they all, you know. And then when we went into the whole improvised philosophy, it made a lot of sense, you know. But there's a funny story. I studied African dance for years and we had to do closed windows because we had life from us. And it came from a neighbor <laughs> that called the police because he can't stand the drumming. We found out that he wanted to be a musician when he was young and something didn't work out. Mm. One of the neighbors in Woodstock and wow. that's why he got so upset and didn't want to hear anything anymore. <laughs> you know, so that's a touching story, actually. Um, the focus of this interview series by the Belsky Foundation is Sage Advice, where industry experts give advice on best practices to the next generation. So may take me a moment to get there, but Ingrid, what you were talking about with your history, I related to very much, because I also started out singing standards. And when I started getting more deeply into improvised music, I found that the more I was willing to go out on a limb and take risks, the more rewarding everything got. And it's mm -hmm. scary sometimes. It, it, it's not yeah. always, and, that, and maybe for vocalists, it's a little extra scary, I don't know, but it can be, it can be a little scary. But the more I was willing to take those risks, Everything just got rewarding, more rewarding, and I think stronger. And something I have been observing in the last few years, and I'm thinking about it, is when I go out to hear music, um, a lot of the younger musicians I'm seeing in jazz and improvised music are playing excellent music from a technical standpoint, but I'm often disappointed because I don't see much risk. I, I, I don't see a lot of willingness to get messy 
And this concerns me. And so in the spirit of advice for the next generation, and I don't know if you agree with me or not, if you disagree with me, feel free to say so. But in the spirit of advice for the next generation, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, about that balance between technical proficiency and then the willingness to, as you said, Carl, put your personality into it. As I said, let it get, let it be a little messy if, if it needs to be so that something can happen, so that the music can really be alive and not just something that's on the page or already in your head. I feel a little shy about it because I'm not a stage, but I try to do my best. Um, we are all pattern people. And so a lot of the young people, for them it would be very new to mm. out of a sudden step into that freedom because they have to still find out exactly who they really are, where everything is coming from, because life out there puts a pattern on everybody. Huh. And people are very sensitive. And so they're getting shy. They're getting shy to express. And so it's a hard one for an advice, you know, is my uh, learning was be in the moment, no past, no future, mm. listen, listen as much as you can. And even when you think standards, you know, we have to also listen, listen to ourselves, listen to the, um, this one. <laughs> and um, so it's a it's a hard one, you know, because usually you get it when you get older, you know. And I found I did teenage young teenage workshops at CMS. They were fantastic, and they were a terror because the attention they weren't used to it. They weren't willing to listen to something new. So uh, we get it slowly later on, you know, but mm. that's what I can that's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. The most important is, and I grew up like that, that everybody has it. Everybody has the ability. Right. It's our choice if we don't sing. It's our choice if we don't pick up an instrument. Mm. But we all have it, you know, and yeah. so it's in every kid. It's in, and um, yeah. who am I to say, Andrea? <laughs> well, I feel the same way. Who am I to say? But we all have opinions, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's part of being human. Carl, yeah. what are your thoughts? Yeah. We have an obligation. Yeah. Pass on and help. No. Carl, do you want to uh, jump in here too? No. I think uh, the biggest advice that's easiest to follow and that's the hardest to actually do is to switch from thinking to listening. It's a switch that we can make every moment in our lives, even in conversations in uh, every situation right. all the time and the way to do that is the best way to do that is to use your voice singing or humming if you only hum may barely your name your your partner may barely hear it or you you're somewhere in the subway and, you know in your car and you, you hum with the motor. Mm. Motor is already a hum, so you can tune into it. And you stop. Once you have this vibration in your head, it automatically makes you stop thinking. Mm. It gets you into in your natural state of mind because your natural state of mind is pure feeling. And, and 
spontaneous action, not not action that comes from thinking, action that comes like like avoiding an accident. That's like spontaneous action. Right? You're not thinking. You, if you think, you're too late. Same thing is true for music. Thinking is too slow for music. Hmm? Thinking That's, is too slow for music. Yes. Yeah. It, it totally, you know, it's like takes too long. Right. You have a spontaneous state of mind, then the Tibetans call it the natural state of mind. That's uh. how you're born. Everybody's born with a natural state of mind. And you can connect to that natural state of mind through music, but also through just like using your words. That's a very, a very fast one. Or yes. through um deep listening going into what you hear rather than what you think right. comes to you what comes from the outside you know just just always going there it's like a practice and the right practice, the practice is a lifelong practice it never ends Papa Casals practiced yeah. his instrument the day before he died why it's the practice of life, of living, the practice of your natural state of mind. That's a spontaneous mind. And that's what music is all about. And this is why people are into music. And this is why the world would not exist without music. The word that keeps coming to me as I'm hearing you say this is receiving, because you're from that quiet place. You're receiving. And, and well, what we're trying to teach at CMS is you don't learn music in four or five years going to school. Music is a lifelong practice as a listener and as a player. Right. And there's all these in between stages of people who not become musicians, but they play. Well, they, their, their profession will not be music. Their profession will be good. Absolutely. You, you wouldn't believe how many. Orchestra members in New York came to us in the years that we did it there, who were like unbelievable players. And they would call themselves musicians because because that was their main thing. But they had a different profession. Right. They would do it something else professionally. You know? But they were considering themselves musicians and would play their instruments really well, you know. Uh, but they would like not make a living with it. You know? And so to right. try to understand that music is not a part of being in a profession. Music is a state of mind. It's a way of living, a way of being. Uh, I have to mention one more thing. We were lucky. We met Honored Coleman. And I wish everybody could have. Mm. He was the most humble, intelligent, humorous person. And he said once to us, I was lucky. I became well known. I won awards. But there are so many better musicians out there mm. that should have had that same luck. That was honored, Coleman. So yeah, I wish you or everybody would have met him. Mm. He, it, it's, it gives me goosebumps when I even think about him. <laughs> That's such a uh, wonderful experience that you had that, that you, how, how much that's with you and how now you, you and Carl are that for so many, you give that same gift to so many other people, so. Well, actually, I'd like to plug the Creative Music Studio a little bit because it's alive Please. and well right now. If you go to creativemusic.org, you're going to find a new website in about a month from now. Billy Martin is now running it. And it's, it has a lot of things going on. One thing will be a workshop on the, from, from June 13 to 15 at the New School in New York. And it will be about or, improvising, or, improvising orchestra. I will, I will do the first day there on the 13th of June with uh, students from the new school um, where we're going to have orchestra uh, work and also going through the 
going through the principles of how it works and how what what the process is. And there'll be like different different improvising orchestra leaders doing the next day and the next day with probably completely different principles of how they have worked, you know. And, and that's sort of typical for CMS. There's a lot of contradiction. The teachers come in and say completely different things from another. And the, the participants have to figure out what, what, what their point of view is, what their thing is, how they react to certain things. I mean, we had like situations where Anthony Braxton would teach for a week in Woodstock and then Lee Konitz would come the next week and he would be talking about the complete opposite stuff, you know, and the students would have to sort of make up their minds. Uh. Where, 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 what do they react to? You right. know? So it's not just like a one-way street and one philosophy. It's broader than that. Well, as you said at the beginning uh, of our conversation, in, 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 indirectly, it's not a system. You don't have a... It's exactly. not a system. No, exactly. It's a crucible, I think. But you and, know, the philosophy allowed me to work with people in many different styles. For example, I wrote the string arrangements for Jeff Buckley's Grace album, huh. you know, which is a legendary uh, rock album. Like, how do I get to write strings for him? Well, because because I don't think in terms of rock and jazz and classical and so on. Uh -huh. And Jeff was a guy who wanted something different from the usual string writing. So when I met Jeff, it was like said, oh, you write whatever you want, you know? And uh -huh. we, so we, we came up with things that uh, then the rock world was repeating for years down the road after that. So people can find you at creativemusic.org. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And even though um, Billy Martin is the director now, if that's the right uh, title, but you and you and Ingrid, you're both still very present. Yeah. 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 Billy Martin is the director, but we we have a, like we are the artistic. Yeah. Uh -huh. and we're working with him uh, very closely. But he does have, he comes from a Desky Martin and Wood, he comes okay. from the jam band scene. Okay. And so he opens it up to a whole other audience. Uh, you know, we were more work music oriented at the time. You know, we had people from all over the world teaching there. Right. Billy is sort of adding <laughs> to that now with getting all the young folks in that are jam band oriented, which is like sort of leading, bleeding over into other, many other areas. And that also widens the audience and it widens the potential support. And uh, the, the organization is growing, you know. So it's really, and Billy is very generous with his own work. He, mm -hmm. he plays benefit concerts with Medevsky and other people. And there's a big festival coming up in Woodstock on August 6th at the Baseball Center. Mm -hmm. It'll be Medevsky, Martin and Rebar playing okay. and then there'll be um, probably 20 30 players Ken will be among them uh, that will perform there we, we will perform there of course and but a lot of younger musicians from all over Definitely. and this is a benefit for CMS no it's a it's a festival it's oh, not festival a festival, a festival. ah a festival. beautiful it goes okay. on from 7 till midnight so it's Great. a five hour festival which the, the orchestra will be playing there as well. Ah, wonderful. Yeah. It'll be a great, great event, yeah. This is June, no, August 6th. Okay. Saturday, August 6th. So to wrap up, I'm going to, you have a monthly, uh, f what is it, the f I forget, I'm sorry, it's the first Monday of every month in Kingston? It's the last Sunday afternoon. I was close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, last, the last Sunday afternoon, but it's like very limited in terms of audience because okay. it's soft space. So we have Got 15 it. players, but we're not going to have more than 15 people in the audience. So there's right. actually a waiting list for that. Wow. Well, we don't know yet. Yeah, which we, Billy is Billy is managing the mailing the mail, mailing okay. list. We so, don't know yet because of the COVID. Yeah. Of course, of we course. We don't know how right. how 
much it goes up again. Like everything, yeah. And, and then of course there's the there are the classes coming up, and then the the festival in August. So you have a lot going on, and the classes on June 13th in New York at the New School. Right. And I think every people can find out at creativemusic.org. You know. Right. Creativemusic.org. Thank you. But if you want to reach us personally, you write musicmind at creativemusic.org. That comes directly to us. Okay, musicmind right. at creativemusic.org to reach to both of you. Beautiful. Right. Thank you, Carl and Ingrid. This is, we've known right. each other for a while, but we haven't had a chance to really just sit down and talk right. like this. So it's been oh, yeah. great. Okay, we'll do it soon again. I look forward to next time. <laughs>